since you ended with our current situation, would you say something about the possibilities of a united Iraq, uh, especially since you emphasize that uh, Baghdad, um, Mosul, and, uh, uh, and Basra? Basra, of course, um, had s separate backgrounds. And, uh, and you also indicated when there, uh, there was uh, some cooperation among the Shia, the, uh, the Sunni, and the Kurds. So uh, please. Well, I have to say that uh, this is a very timely question because Senator Biden uh, a few years back wrote an op-ed piece for the New York Times along with Les Gelb in which he proposed cutting Iraq up into three separate countries. Uh, he hasn't mentioned that proposal lately. And I think that enough has passed since uh, he wrote the op-ed to show what the, the essential problem is. The essential problem is, is that particularly in Baghdad, the populations are intermixed. And without the most radical kind of uh, ethnic cleansing, uh, you cannot have uh, uh, homogenous, three homogenous things that one would hope, and this is a personal thing, that the United States, which uh, under the Federalist Papers, led the way in trying to uh, create political frameworks in which uh, different entities could coexist peacefully under a central government, would encourage some form of autonomy for these things, for these things, and also uh, bring about a, a, a a compromise on the control of oil. Uh, that, that's one area where we do have some leverage. And I think this is one of the things that's going to be high on the agenda of the next president. Uh, just to address one thing, which is the Sunni-Shia split. Uh, in 1919, when the British were trying to work out the solution to how they were going to govern under eventually what became a mandate, uh, the Shia represented about half of the population of Iraq, about 25% were Sunni, and the other 25% were Kurds, Christians, and between 150 and 250,000 Jews, depending on who's counting and where they're counting, uh, who were in Baghdad. Of course, those Jews have really disappeared now. Now it's about 66% Shia, uh, with the rest uh, being divided up into Kurds and Sunni. And Gertrude Bell, who was, the, Ger, was really the British expert on the tribes, she wrote about the tribes, uh, she spoke Persian, she spoke Arabic, uh, and she advised both the acting high commissioner, A.T. Wilson, and then Percy Cox, who was the high commissioner, on what to do about the government. And I found it quite interesting, and I think it made a big difference, was that um, the Shia elders uh, insisted that she be veiled, and she insisted that she would not wear a veil. So basically that cut her access off to the Shias, and I don't know why this hasn't been remarked before, but that threw her back on the Sunnis that she knew. Now who were these Sunnis? These were the people, for the most part, who accompanied Faisal and Lawrence in the Arab Revolt. That Many of them uh, educated in uh, what was then Constantinople, now Istanbul, uh, and had been in the Ottoman army, uh, some of them had come from Syria. They were, they were educated city people, while most of the country were uh, uneducated rural Shia. So this already set up a problem uh, in government, which we're living with today. And one of your speakers, uh, uh, Nazar, who, who, yes, Vali Nazar, okay, gave a very interesting talk about a year and a half ago on the Shia uh, revival, and basically he said, which is evident, which in this whole situation we have now, the big winners are the Shia, and they're going to have to be contended with. And it's not going to end up with, uh, you know, half and half power sharing with the Sunni. It's going to be a Shia government. Now, whether the country will hold together under that or not it remains to be seen, but the, the Shia are not going to be uh, settled into some sort of binational state.